Imagine for a minute, you're in Asia Minor or modern day Turkey, but it's the first century, and you're hearing the Gospel of John for the first time. Also, suppose you've already heard the Gospel of Mark, Matthew, and Luke, as they were almost certainly written earlier. What questions or differences might you notice? Well, any person upon hearing the Gospel would immediately notice that John's Gospel is quite unique when it comes to sharing the same material as the Synoptic Gospels. In fact, 88% of the Gospel of John is not found anywhere in the Synoptic Gospels. You might also start scratching your head after a little while of hearing this saying, what are these stories I'm hearing that are not found in the Synoptic Gospels, like turning water into wine, Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, the Samaritan woman, the raising of Lazarus, the washing of the disciples' feet, and Jesus' long discourse on the night of his crucifixion. In a similar manner, where are Jesus' teachings like eating with sinners, Jesus' baptism, the Lord's Supper, transfiguration, his temptations, parables, even miracles, they are all absent from John's Gospel. These are some of the questions that are asked after reading John's Gospel, especially in light of the other Gospels. And who is this disciple whom Jesus loved? Now, some have postulated that the disciple whom Jesus loved was none other than Lazarus, and to be honest, there is some compelling arguments to buttress that claim. For example, in John 11, who was reanimated or brought back to life? Lazarus. And it is said, he is the one whom Jesus loved. Now, others have thought maybe Thomas wrote the gospel, or even a community of believers known as the Johannian community, as we see the use of the word we in chapter 21. Nonetheless, this individual insists that he witnessed the crucifixion, he was put in charge of caring for Jesus' mother, and he beat Peter to the empty tomb. And Peter asked regarding the one whom Jesus loved, what about him? To which Jesus said, what is it to you if he remains until I come? You follow me. So this has led a lot of skeptical modern scholars to reject the authenticity of John's gospel. Now, there's a lot we could say here, but it's hard to imagine that the author, John, is ignorant of the information or the core teachings of Jesus, and that in his gospel, he simply chooses to not repeat everything the other gospel writers already proclaimed. It seems quite likely that his audience is probably familiar with some or all of the other gospels. In fact, the early church historian Eusebius of Caesarea says, the three written gospels in general circulation also came into John's hands. He welcomed them, it is said, and affirmed their accuracy, but noted that the narrative lacked only the account of what Christ had done at the beginning of his mission. And this is true. The three evangelists recorded what the Savior did only one year following the imprisonment of the Baptist, and they indicated this at the beginning of their narratives, Matthew 4, Mark 1, and Luke 3. So contrary to those who disregard John as being a faithful transmission of Jesus' teachings, we have to understand that much of John's Gospel actually dovetails the Synoptic Gospels nicely. Let me give you a few examples. On the night of the Last Supper, the Synoptic Gospels omit things like the washing of the disciples' feet and Jesus' teaching of the Paraclete or the Holy Spirit, who will come when he goes. So what John does is, he gives us the details that are otherwise missed or not added for one reason or the other. Here's one more example. In Mark 14:49. Jesus is on trial standing before the Jewish Sanhedrin, and he refers to the many times that he taught in the temple precincts without being arrested. But when you read the Synoptic Gospels, it appears that Jesus was only there once. Well, John gives us those details. Quick question, how long was Jesus' ministry? If you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it appears to only be a year long. John, however, tells us implicitly that Jesus' ministry was three years long because of the three Passover celebrations that Jesus participated in. Now, real quickly, just to bounce back to the authorship of the Gospel. I will tell you of the four Gospels, this one is likely the most difficult as far as pinning down an author. However, the person is intimately acquainted with all perspectives of topography. Jacob's Well, Pool of Bethesda, and the Pool of Siloam, festivals and traditions. Jesus' teaching and many details that are referenced in the Synoptic Gospels. 
Now as far as a date, I don't know. Something very interesting that demonstrates this was likely written later is a strong polemic against the Jews. When you read John's Gospel, he always says, the Jews. Also, John is very adamant that Jesus is the fulfillment of Jewish festivals, suggesting a later date sometime after the temple was destroyed. Now next week, when we do our historical Jesus study lesson, we'll find out that people who do historical Jesus study reject John as reliable because it differs so dramatically from the Synoptic Gospels. In this slide, I want to take just a moment or two to discuss an overall outline for looking at the Gospel of John. On the far left side of the screen, you see the prologue, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. This is where Jesus is recognized as the Lagos, or the Word. Jesus is God incarnate, or God in flesh. Around chapter 6 is the turning point where Peter responds to Jesus as Messiah similarly to the Synoptic Gospels. This is followed by the Book of Signs from 119 to 1250. And in this section, Jesus performs seven signs, what the Synoptic Gospels would call miracles. By the time we arrive to chapter 13, this is known as the Book of Glory from 13.1 to 2031. In this section, you will see Jesus' private teaching with the disciples and Jesus' farewell discourse. Finally, we come to the epilogue, chapter 21, 1 through 25. This is followed by the resurrection appearances and the restoration of Peter. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. The initial statements in verses 1 through 4 made about Jesus and his identity are the most profound in the New Testament. John presents Jesus as the Word or the pre-existent creator of the cosmos, distinct from the Father, yet fully divine. Now John's use of the word, word, does have significance in Greek philosophical thought but it is also anchored in the Old Testament. The psalmist says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, Psalm 33, 6. In Greek philosophy, the word, word, is what brought the cosmos in order. And a Jewish philosopher and contemporary of Jesus, Philo of Alexandria, said, The word was a messenger of God and a mediator between God and man. Quick question. In verse 1, where else do we read in the beginning? Genesis 1. So in the prologue, the author immediately begins with this allusion to Genesis 1, and he attaches Jesus as the creator. The writer goes on to say, the word was with God, and the word was God. So there is a distinction between the Father and Son, but both are fully divine. 
Now, I want to talk about John's unique literary style. You can see I've used a lot of yellow and highlights here. So in the next slide, let's briefly discuss that. St. John's literary style is unique to say the least. It is highlighted with contrast between light and darkness, truth and falsehood, life and death, and above and below. And while John has a seemingly basic vocabulary with words like know, abide, believe, witness, truth, and the world, they carry profound theological significance. So in chapter 1, we saw in John's prologue the contrast between light and darkness. And that should tip us off as readers that John is going to be employing contrasts like that to make certain points. Let me give an example of John's use of light and darkness in his gospel. If you have your Bible, turn to John chapter 3. This is a very famous exchange that Jesus has with the fellow from the Jewish Sanhedrin, Nicodemus. Now, in verse 2, John tells us that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. Is that significant in John's Gospel? Absolutely. Why? Because Nicodemus is placed against the light and darkness theme of John. Because he's not in the light as of yet. Nicodemus still does not understand the truth. Now, how do you know I'm not just making this up? Maybe it really was dark and I'm just using conjecture. And maybe Nicodemus was afraid. Well. We know that John is using the light-darkness contrast because that is the theme in John's Gospel and in all of his writings. Also, Nicodemus knows that Jesus is a teacher from God, but he's just not sure about who Jesus is or his identity, so he's still in the dark. When Paul escapes the city walls in Damascus at night, was that incidental or intentional to the message of Acts? It's incidental, because there's nothing in Acts to make me believe otherwise. Rather, St. Paul was simply making use of the cover of night. Teaching Types in the Gospel of John Jesus' teachings in the Gospel of John fall into three teaching types. Personal interviews, for example, Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman, debates with the Jewish leaders, chapters 5 through 10, and private teachings with his disciples in chapters 14 through 16. When we talk about personal interviews, here Jesus uses spiritual metaphors. A metaphor is a way of making a comparison with something that it doesn't literally represent. So when Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Jesus is not implying that Nicodemus needs to be born again, as in born again. Rather, he needs to reform his ways. Likewise, the woman at the well. Jesus says, whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst. Jesus is saying that he possesses the power to truly satisfy. Secondly, debates with Jewish leaders. So when Jesus performs a sign or teaches, there is oftentimes opposition with his opponents. This provokes a response or challenge from his hearers, which results in further teaching. If you have the Gospel of John open, look at chapter 7. This debate ends with some people calling Jesus a prophet, others that he is the Christ, and still others denying that the Christ could come from Galilee. Thirdly, private teaching. This is a long section where Jesus describes the coming of the Holy Spirit. This is where Jesus identifies himself as the true vine. And it is also where Jesus warns the disciples of an impending persecution. The signs in the Gospel of John, beginning in chapter 119 through 1250. Here, John's Gospel contains seven miracles or signs. Jesus turns water into wine. One of the official's sons is healed. Jesus also heals the disabled man at the pool of Bethesda, and he feeds the 5,000. There is the walking on water, and the healing of a man born blind, culminating in the raising of Lazarus. And these signs play a key role in Jesus' self-revelation. For example, when Jesus feeds the 5,000, which is recorded in all four Gospel accounts, 
we read that Jesus then gives a discourse or teaching that he is the bread of life. Also in chapter 11, after reanimating or raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus says he is the resurrection and the life. John 11, 25 through 26. Now another of Jesus' signs, in fact John states, the first of his signs was what? Jesus turned water into wine. John basically says that this miracle really cut the groundwork for Jesus' ministry as being his first. Let's talk about this miracle for just a minute or two because this is important. If you have your Bible, turn to John chapter 2 verses 1 through 12. Now, contextualizing this, we know that weddings in ancient Near East were not simply significant personal events. They carried lots of symbolism. These were times of fantastic celebration that would go on for days and days, and much wine was consumed, lots of food, and lots of fellowship. Now, first of all, to run out of wine at a wedding would have been a social disaster. But what about wine? What is significant about wine and what the bridegroom says in verse 10? Here, the better wine comes later, after the earlier wine. And what does that suggest? This suggests the arrival of a new age in which the full celebration can begin, a messianic celebration, if you will. This is the good wine. Do you remember in the Synoptic Gospels when Jesus says, no one pours new wine into old wineskins? Why? Because a new age was being ushered in and the Messiah has arrived. There is one other important little nugget in this passage. Look at verse 4. Jesus says, My hour has not yet come. The person initially hearing this read might be wondering, what does Jesus mean? Well, this is a phrase that is used here and is repeated throughout the gospel in chapter 7, 8, 12, 13, culminating in 17, 1, when Jesus says, Father, the time has come. In John's Gospel, Jesus' identity is on center stage. And in John, we get what we call a very high Christology. Jesus is the unique Son of God. He is the Word. And whoever has seen Him has seen the Father. Jesus claims He is the I Am who existed before Abraham. In chapter 8, 24, 28, and 58, Jesus shares God's attributes. He is the creator of all things the giver and sustainer of life. John 5, 16 through 18, and John 6, 27, and verse 35. But his use of the I am is significant in that his audience would have intimate knowledge of the unspeakable name Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. In passing, we find Jesus closing many statements with Amen, Amen, or truly, truly. This implies finality and an authority of Jesus' message, which is unparalleled elsewhere. No scribe or rabbi is ever recorded saying, Truly, truly, I say to you. This demonstrates Jesus' unique authority, presenting himself as one who speaks on behalf of God. One last note in passing. In the role of the Holy Spirit in John's Gospel, nowhere do we get as close of a demonstration of the Trinity as in John's Gospel. And we find that in chapters 14 through 16, where Jesus mentions the paraclete, the helper, the advocate, or the counselor, who will come and guide you, and to teach you, and to comfort you. The Turning Point in the Gospel of John. If you have your Bible, turn to chapter 6. This is a puzzling teaching for modern Protestant Christians. And this has to do with regard to the bread from heaven, or eating Jesus' flesh and drinking his blood. For the last 450 years, most Protestants have regarded Jesus' teaching here as merely symbolic or hyperbole. But this symbolism provokes a crisis among some of Jesus' disciples, and they stop following him because of this difficult teaching. Remember, John's Gospel does not include the Last Supper or Communion. Rather, he records the events surrounding it. So this seems to be his acknowledging or 
teaching of the Eucharist. You know, for a number of years, I also took this passage in the Eucharist to be merely symbolic, based on my Protestant tradition. But I later discovered that for over 1,500 years of church history, the church has unanimously understood the Eucharist to be the literal body and blood of Jesus. The great reformer himself, Martin Luther, even held this belief, as did John Calvin. I have written much about this topic in much more depth, and I'm not going to go into it here, but you could certainly visit my website. So, if you're curious to learn more, you can simply go to nicknorby.com and under the search engine, type communion. So, Jesus asks his closest followers whether they're going to leave him as well. And who responds? Peter, of course. Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. So, like Peter's confession in the other Gospels where he says you are the Messiah, the Son of God, and you see the Gospels churn from that point, so too you do in John's Gospel as well. This is a turning point, if you will, because this part of the Gospel ends on sort of a note of failure because some of Jesus' disciples have deserted him. But Jesus' true followers acknowledge that he is indeed the Holy One of God. The Woman Caught in Adultery If you have your Bible, turn it to John 7, 53. You know, this is one of the most beloved stories told. If you ever watch movies on Jesus, this story is always included. Even if you watch Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, which only deals with Jesus' final hours, it contains this story as sort of a flashback moment. So even Mel Gibson couldn't resist adding this. Now, the storyline of this narrative is great. It takes place on the temple precincts, the Pharisees are present, and they approach Jesus with a woman who is caught in adultery. And they publicly challenge Jesus, saying that the law of Moses states that the adulteress is to be stoned, and they want to get Jesus' opinion. Should we stone her or show mercy? Of course, it's a trap. Because if Jesus says let her go, he's violating the Mosaic law. And if he says stone her, he is in danger of going against his own teaching of forgiveness and mercy. So Jesus begins to write in the sand. And he says, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. Naturally, one by one they leave. And the woman looks up at Jesus and Jesus says, Woman, where are they? Is there no one who condemns you? Neither do I. Go and sin no more. What an awesome story. The problem is, it's not in John's original gospel. This does not mean that the story isn't true. In fact, it probably was a true story. It was likely part of an oral tradition of sayings of things that Jesus did. But it's just not found in our earliest, most reliable manuscripts of John's Gospel. And scholars both conservative and liberal agree that this story is not part of John's original writing. For example, the literary style is totally different. Lots of words come up that are found nowhere else in John's Gospel. In fact, our earliest, most reliable manuscripts of John, P66 and P75, both lack this passage. Likewise, both Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus all lack this passage as well. In fact, almost all manuscripts through the first eight centuries omit this passage. The oldest manuscript that contains this passage is a 5th century codex called Bezai, which is a very eccentric gospel where the scribe was taking huge blocks of a text and copying them onto new codices or paper. Now here's an interesting point because most textual critics who study the syntax or style of this passage say the writing looks like it's actually from the Gospel of Luke. And there is a whole family of manuscripts that actually contain this passage in Luke 21. The second ending. This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Some scholars suggest that John's Gospel ends at 2031. 
Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. If so, where does all the extra material come from? Well, some people have suggested there was a later insertion by the Johannian community with the we, but I'm a little hesitant to buy that idea. As Andreas Kostenberger, an expert in the Gospel of John, has pointed out, a closer look at chapters 20 and 21 suggests that they do cohere quite closely. For example, in chapter 21, John says, This was now the third time Jesus appeared to them, which presupposes two previous resurrection appearances recounted in chapter 20. Also, chapter 21 provides a climax as Peter gets restored, and the disciple whom Jesus loved was there as a witness. And finally, all early manuscripts contain chapter 21. It seems like it corresponds quite well. John's purpose in writing his gospel. In John 20:25, 20, we're told, Jesus did other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Likewise, in John 20, 30 and 31, we read, Jesus performed many signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The fourth gospel's purpose is crystal clear. John writes to call forth faith in Jesus. So while this gospel is evangelistic, it is also intended to bring confidence for all believers as well. And the author of this gospel is utterly convinced that Jesus, while being fully human, was much more than that. He was not just the Son of God, but God the Son. And while you may occasionally hear that John's Gospel gives an inflated view of Jesus as deity, while Matthew, Mark, and Luke are not nearly as explicit, remember that John, the other Gospel writers, and Paul were strictly monotheistic Jews who did not make it a practice to pray to dead rabbis. They only believed in one God, and to bring prayers and petitions to a dead rabbi, or to sing songs to him, or to celebrate meals in his name would have been an abomination to them had he not been vindicated and resurrected from the dead. And this is something we could study at a later time, and that is the evidence for the high exaltation that these men and women gave to Jesus, as I previously mentioned, prayer, meals, and songs. And John, or the disciple whom Jesus loved, claimed to be an eyewitness to these events, and he was in a position to know the truth of the matter. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. God bless and have a great week.